for Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in general when he took over as academic dean in 1963. And many of us still chart the course of generous evangelicalism that Dr. Concer envisioned for this place and himself embodied. Dr. Concer's doctoral dissertation at Harvard University focused on the knowledge of God and John Calvin. And this brings us back to the difference between natural and revealed theology. Calvin compared the philosopher who gets a glimpse of the truth about God to a traveler passing through a field at night who in a momentary lightning flash sees far and wide, but the sight vanishes so swiftly that he's plunged again into darkness of the night before he can even take a step. Now, in the Midwest, those of us who dwell in the land discovered again this summer, a lightning can strike thousands of times an hour, and a traveler foolhardy enough to cross the Great Plains during such a thunderstorm might be able to find his way, but only with great difficulty. Christian travelers hope for more than a strobe light unto our path, and so the need for revealed theology, a bright, shining, steady light. God is light, and he makes himself known in the person of the one who says, I am the light of the world, and in the scriptures that attest him. And we come to God's word, special revelation, with the expectation there is more light yet to shine forth. Tonight's speaker, then, is not the light, but he is one of the brightest luminaries in the current constellation of Christian theology. There are many things we theologians have to read to keep up with our field, but when we read for the love of it, for the love of God, we read John Webster. Professor Webster has been professor of systematic theology at King's College Aberdeen, Scotland, since 2003. For the previous seven years, he was Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity at the University of Oxford. Before that, he taught at the Toronto School of Theology and before that in Durham, England. He has his PhD from the University of Cambridge. And the fruit of that work, his doctoral dissertation, introduced the English-speaking world to the important German theologian Eberhard Jungel. But that was only the first phase of his published work. He's produced a second wave of books, including a Cambridge companion that have sealed his reputation as one of the foremost interpreters of the theology and ethics of Karl Barth. He also co-founded the International Journal of Systematic Theology with Colin Gunton. And he's the series editor of The Great Theologians and Bart Studies for Ashgate. More recently, Professor Webster has been writing his own theology, including monographs on holiness and the doctrine of scripture at an impressive Bart-like pace. I commend to you in particular two recent collections on church dogmatics, Word and Church, and Confessing God. And in his own words, dogmatics is often caricatured as the unholy science that reduces the practices of piety to lifeless propositions, but far from it. Dogmatics is that delightful activity in which the church praises God by ordering its thinking towards the gospel of Christ. That's the perfect definition and the perfect sentiment with which to start a series on revealed theology. So we're privileged to have Professor Webster deliver the concert lectures. John, May there be light. <laughs> well, thank you, Kevin, very much. Uh, my first words, of course, should be words of considerable gratitude for the invitation to inaugurate this lecture series. Uh, it's not only an honour, but a delight to be here. Gatherings like this, stimulated by memory of and gratitude for faithful Christian witnesses, signify, I think, something very important in theological work, which is that theology is, in part, an act of obedience to the fifth commandment. That is, it needs to keep its eyes on the past and on the dead, whether they be the long dead or those of recent memory. Theology is the work of reason in the society of the saints. And how that society lives and speaks the gospel now can't be isolated from the gifts which are offered to us from the past. Among those gifts are those who've pondered the gospel, who've built institutions, 
and pray that the church would be maintained in its evangelical profession. Such, of course, was the one in whose memory these lectures are to be given. They concern revealed theology. And one of the characteristics of revealed theology at its best is alertness to where the church has been. Tradition isn't a dead hand. It's the presence to us of episodes, texts, ideas, and people through whom we can be open to the scope of the life and truth of the gospel. And with that, to our theme. At the centre of the Christian confession lies the reality of Emmanuel, God with us. This name, because it is a name, it's a personal history and not just a state of affairs, this name gathers into itself the entire economy of God's dealings with creatures. God with us is the beginning and end of the ways of God towards the creation, and so God with us determines the present creaturely condition. Created being in its totality is comprehended by this name, by the reality which it signifies and which is enacted by the one who bears it. It is, we might say, a name which indicates a miracle. What the name Emmanuel picks out is a saving act and presence which can't be reduced to created time and agency, for its content is wholly astonishing. God himself, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, God himself is with us. Or as the fourth evangelist has it, the word which was in the beginning with God dwelt among us. Well, these lectures are to be a reflective expansion of the name Emmanuel. In them, I'm going to try to characterise the fellowship between God and creatures which is the matter of Christian faith, a fellowship which stretches from the formation of creatures from the dust to the new Jerusalem and which has its temporal centre in the history of the incarnate Son of God. If that fellowship is properly to be understood, if the specific force of with in God with us is to be grasped, then I think we need an anatomy of the name Emmanuel which doesn't think in terms of an easy, pacific coordination of God and creatures. Reflective expansion of the name mustn't eliminate the tension-laden character of the relation between God and us which that name and title announces. For if God with us is really that, God with us, Then, in the fellowship which he inaugurated and sustains with creatures, God does not become simply one term in a relation, a kind of counterpart to the creature. God dwelling among us does not mean that he does not dwell in unapproachable light. Nor, on the other hand, can the sheer unapproachableness of God mean that he is locked by his nature into separation. For precisely as the one he is, the blessed and only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords, God is with us. Well, it's this matter. It's temporal unfolding in the divine economy, and it's grounds in the eternal being of the triune God, which is our concern in these lectures. A particular focus of attention will be deploying the distinction between uncreated and created being in the right way. That distinction, I want to try to argue, is fundamental, and neglect of it is a fount of ills. But it must be disciplined if it's pressed into service by the gospel. As the uncreated one, the triune God, who has life in and from himself, determines himself to be with his creatures, to love them, to come to their aid and glorify them. God's perfection and God's presence, the plenitude of God's own life and his life-giving relation to creatures are to be set out in their integrity and in their ordered sequence. 
Well, it will be readily apparent, I suppose, that both my theme and the way I'm going to address it languish at the margins of contemporary theology. And this, indeed, is a first and main reason for bringing it forward for discussion. The distinction between uncreated and created, or at least what that distinction is gesturing towards, because the distinction itself isn't wholly adequate, the distinction between uncreated and created is, I think, evangelically basic, and without it, we risk losing touch with much that's primary in understanding the history of fellowship, which is the economy of God's grace. But much contemporary theology judges differently, sometimes by placing time, matter, and bodies at the center of the gospel of incarnation, sometimes by making much of union with or participation in God as the end of creatureliness. In both texts, the communication of properties plays a very large role. But I want to ask, what might happen if we looked at God's fellowship with us differently, trying to register the dogmatic and metaphysical turbulence brought about by the sheer miraculous character of the presence with us of the perfect God? What if the relations of God and creatures require us always to retain a clear sense of the ever greater dissimilarity between them as something which has no resolution, not even incarnational or eschatological. At the very least, I suggest, dogmatics and the metaphysics which it designs as an auxiliary in explicating the gospel will be impelled by this to make its way into some underexplored territory the imminent relations of God's life, the pretemporal pact of salvation between Father and Son, the eternal sufficiency of the pre-incarnate word, in short, the unassimilable character of God's perfect life. Far from drawing attention away from the temporal benefits of the gospel of God's presence, an evangelical dogmatics of divine perfection tries to display just what those benefits are, by showing at whose hands we receive them and with what very great grace. An example may help set matters in relief. A radically new reading of Luther is proposed by the Finnish historical theologian Tuomo Manama and his school, and it exercises some considerable sway amongst ecumenically minded Lutherans. At the core of Manama's account of Luther is a theology of divine presence, summarised in the slogan in Ipsa Fide Christus Adest, Christ present in faith. Well, as, as Manama reads him, Luther is doubly obscured from us. First of all, by the extrinsicist forensic theology of Melanchthon and the formula of Concord, and then later by the inherited Kantian and Richlian moralism, which conceives of the relation of God to creatures in terms of causal divine will and creaturely effect. The result, Manama argues, is the eclipse of Luther's theology of God's inhabitation of creatures, which Manama seeks to rescue from undeserved obscurity. Christ, he says, and therefore his entire person and work is really and truly present in faith itself. Put differently, Christ, he argues, is not simply a divine favour, but the gift in faith in which God himself is present in the fullness of his essence. So you can see that for him, faith is not so much a stretching out towards an alien righteousness as itself the inhabiting presence of God. Undergirding this is a Christology and a theology of salvation in which he says Christ is a kind of collective person in whose deity believers participate in faith. In faith, he says, human beings really participate in the person of Christ and in the divine life and victory that come in him. Christ gives his person to us through faith. Faith means participation in Christ. 
And if that's so, then because faith is real union with Christ, because Christ is faith subject, not just a believed object external to faith, then he says we can speak in highly realistic terms of a personal union between the believer and Christ and of the believer's participation in the divine life. Well, what do we make of this? Whether Luther's theology dovetails quite so snugly with, for example, Aquinas' theology of the special presence of God by gracious inhabitation is, I guess, a matter for experts. An historical amateur like me may perhaps wonder whether Luther may not be serving as occasion for the pursuit of other concerns. For our present interests, however, what's most important to notice is a certain narrowing of dogmatic scope in Manama's account. In overcorrecting moralistic or personalist presentations of Luther as hostile to ontology, Manama can't himself avoid some distortion of the notion of Christ's presence, associating it wholly with ontological union, participation, and divine indwelling. And notice what happens. The reference back of divine presence to divine perfection is scarcely retained, and thereby divine presence itself is only inadequately formulated. What's problematic in Manama's view of the divine economy is, I think, ultimately to be traced to some unresolved Trinitarian and Christological problems. God, he says, is in relation to himself in this movement of the word. Indeed, he is this movement of the word. Well, of course, there's a deep truth there. But its exposition requires, I think, consideration of the eternal relations of father and son, and especially consideration of the son's eternal generation by the father, if that divine presence to faith is properly to be characterised. And further, it requires much more to be said Christologically about the eternal deity of the word as the condition of his becoming, about the distinction of natures in the incarnate one, about the transcendence of the exalted Christ, even in his presence in the spirit. Now the point of all this is to say that in rightly rejecting that rather deistic moralism that we find in the high liberal tradition, Manama misses something crucial to the gospel's economy of grace to which I want to keep returning through these lectures, namely the infinite depth in and uncaused liberty of God which is the antecedent condition for God's presence. Without an operative sense of God's perfection, God's presence is mischaracterized, along with the fellowship with creatures to which it gives rise. I want to suggest that the fellowship of the perfect God and his creatures is not best thought of as creaturely participation in the divine life, but what Bart, in a perhaps somewhat unhappy phrase, called togetherness at a distance. And this leads to a second motive for pursuing this topic. Contemporary theologians invested in the ontological communion of God and creatures commonly suggest that the alternative is ruinous. Extrinsicism. The reduction of relations of God and creatures to an encounter, sometimes a conflict, of wills. Much energy has been exposed, has been devoted to exposing the roots of this so-called extrinsicism, particularly, of course, in the breakdown in the later medieval period of the metaphysics of creaturely being as participation in the divine essence and its replacement by what's generally judged to be a woefully inadequate causal model of action at a distance. Read radical orthodoxy literature and you'll find this all over. Well, does talk of God's perfection inevitably share these shortcomings and subject the gospel to an alien ontology? Well, that there is an unbaptized metaphysics which resists the Christian confession of the presence of the gospel's God, there can be no doubt. Nor may we dispute dispute 
that there is a dogmatics which systematically separates God from creatures, though, contra many critics, it wasn't written by Bart. Yet to anchor God's presence in God's perfection is not to deny God's relations to creatures, it's simply to acknowledge their special character as relations between the free, uncreated God and those whom he calls into being. Nor is it to fall into a competitive idiom in which God's perfection can be maintained only at cost to creaturely being. Such a concept of perfection is precisely not a conception of perfection. For perfection is incommensurable. It needs no other to establish its fullness. Perfection doesn't reduce all relations to the externalities of cause and effect. And presence doesn't require ontological participation. More than anything, the metaphysics has to follow the prompting of the divine economy which the gospel sets forth. And so the charge of extrinsicism, therefore, can, I think, best be met just by patient description of the gospel's substance, which is, once again, the covenant fellowship between the perfect God and his creatures, at whose centre is the one whom God instructs us to name Emmanuel. So our theme then is this twofold affair of God and God with us, God's imminent perfection and his economic presence. As we turn to look in a little more detail at how the presentation of this theme is going to proceed, it's crucial to understand that the order of exposition has to follow the material order of the topic. These two divisions of our theme are not to be conceived as two foci of an ellipse whose coexistence is essential to each. For what then could be made of the presence of God? What would be meant by divine perfection if it stood in need of the equilibrium provided by some other pole of reality? No, the divisions of the theme exist in a strict and irreversible sequence. First God's perfection... Then, by derivation, God's presence. Once again, Emmanuel would be unthinkable if the with us didn't rest upon and draw its substance from the anterior life of God himself. Otherwise, there would be no miracle, no matter for astonishment in the confession of his presence. Only in this way can the non-necessary wholly gratuitous character of God's presence be registered. Now, in following this sequence, I'm going to offer a conceptual reconstruction of the economy of God's dealings with creatures grounded upon an account of God's imminent perfection. Conceptual reconstruction is the basic task of Christian dogmatics. In undertaking this task, dogmatics stands beneath the canon of prophetic and apostolic texts and the order of reality set forth therein, which we can call the works of God. Deference to the canon is crucial to dogmatic theology, even though dogmatics' idiom is conceptual and even though its organisation is often topical rather than dramatic. The question of the relation between canonical and dogmatic idiom and canonical and dogmatic order is, of course, a fine matter. And I think it's one of art rather than one of rules determinable in advance. Dogmatic theology, in other words, has to tread cautiously here because topical treatment mustn't overwhelm the canonical norm. It has to serve it as commentary. This, I've come to think, is usually best achieved in dogmatics by retaining a basic canonical and creedal outline, essentially the economy of creation to the last things, into which conceptual and topical discussion is interpolated as a set of substantial explanatory glosses, but not, note, as a speculative improvement upon the canonical, charismatic presentation. This has to retain its primacy. 
But there's a further point, however, and one, it seems to me, of some contemporary acuteness. As it goes about this kind of conceptual reconstruction, dogmatics, if it does its work attentively, is going to find itself pressed to relate the divine economy to the high mystery of God's life in himself. Now, why? Well, in order to indicate what the economy of God's works is. Namely, it's that sequence of acts which constitute the external works of God, the one who in boundless grace relates to finite things as their creator, Lord, and saviour. The economy is the field of God's acts. And those acts are external in the sense that they're to be seen not just in terms of their temporal occurrence and effect, but also in terms of the infinite depth from which they originate and in terms of the one into whose presence they introduce us. This being so, dogmatic treatment of God's outgoing works has to be prefaced and accompanied all along by reflection about God in himself. An account of the divine economy, I've come to think, will be fragile if it's detached from consideration of the inward works of God. That is, the imminent relations and processions of the triune persons and the eternal divine counsel in which God determines to be God with us. If it's to discharge its duties in explicating the gospel, dogmatics cannot evade being preoccupied with these matters too all the more so in the present, when they're threatened by oblivion. In the canon, of course, these matters don't appear routinely in conceptual form. They tend to appear as corollaries of the names of God and of descriptions of his work. As Aquinas will put it, they're not there verbally, but in sense. But, like the doctrine of the Trinity, of which it forms part, Preoccupation with the internal life of God himself isn't a speculative alternative to concern with God's economic works. Rather, it raises with due modesty the question of the identity of the God who presents himself in his works in the world, the one from whose infinite freedom the economy emerges. Who is this one, dogmatics asks? Well, he is in himself perfect, His utter sufficiency is the condition and energy of his presence. And why does he ask towards us? Why does he act towards us and dwell among us? To glorify himself in the glorification of creatures. So this then is the material justification for rooting a construal of God's presence in an understanding of God's perfection. Put very simply, the identity of the gospel's God requires that we do so. Well, once again, a comparison may help. In 1958, the French Dominican Yves Congar published a remarkable study of the manner of God's presence to creatures, which he entitled The Mystery of the Temple. The book had actually been written four years earlier during Congar's exile at the École Biblique in Jerusalem, where he'd been banished for his association with the then suspect Nouvelle Théologie. Within a decade, of course, it would triumph at Vatican II. Congar's work is a classic of ressourcement, biblical theological exposition of the economy of salvation. Its central thesis, essentially Augustinian and Thomist, is that the divine economy enacts what he calls God's ever more generous, ever deeper presence among his creatures. That the story of God's dwelling with us moves towards a definite end characterised by the highest possible degree of inward religion. This Congar expands by tracing the placing significance of the temple in the canonical writings. The modulations on this theme of temple serve him as a sort of register of the development of understanding of God's relations to creatures, a move from presence to, to what he calls personal communication, and ultimately, indwelling. Above all, 
temple is interpreted by Congar in quasi-sacramental terms as a temporal and spatial locale in which the presence of God is given, though not stabilised. The metaphysics of temple, if you want, is, as he calls it, the utter transcendence of God asserted in a purely human history. So, uh, on his account, as the economy proceeds, temple is seen as an anticipatory realisation of the materiality and embodiment which will characterise God's definitive presence in the incarnation of the Son. The economy of the divine presence, he says, will culminate in a bodily presence. And that presence is the incarnate Son, a personal and substantial coming into the world of the word of God himself. And so, more particularly for Congar, Jesus becomes the true temple, the place where we will find God's presence and salvation. This leads Congar to a theology of the church as mystical body in which to the incarnational presence there corresponds an indwelling of God with creatures as the exalted son communicates himself to his body through the Eucharist. Through the sacrament the church becomes supremely the body of Christ and the temple of God. Consummated in the mystery of his incarnation and the sacramental ecclesial body of Christ God's presence can't be restricted to a purely representational or interior order. Rather, God's presence is communication, inhabitation, materiality, social and historical visibility, above all, embodiment. Well, if you go away and read Congar's book, you'll find there, I think, a spiritual cogency and vitality though its style of biblical theology will find very few friends amongst historians of biblical literature and religion, it's hard, I think, not to be moved by watching a mind soaked in scripture and tradition ranging lovingly through the canon. If, nevertheless, there remains something unsettling here, it's that divine presence is, once again, insufficiently tethered to divine perfection. It's not that Congar lacks a sense of the sheer gratuity of God's presence, far from it. Presence is, for him, sheer gift. It's more that by fastening on temple as the heart of divine presence, Congar tends to restrict the relations of God to creatures to dwelling and, supremely, indwelling. A rich, incarnational, ecclesial, sacramental theology of communion results. But it's one which, nevertheless, finds it difficult to articulate the distance between God and creatures, even in the intimacy of their fellowship. Congar is much more preoccupied with the union, the unio of God and creatures, than with the unitio, the act of unifying, which can't be resolved into a state of union. This, of course, is in part because of the preponderant significance which he accords to the theology of Christ's body in its incarnational ecclesial and Eucharistic senses. The lack of segregation between these different senses is of course significant. One effect of it is that the sheer difference of the exalted Christ tends to be underplayed, as is also Christ's presence as ruler who exercises his dominion through his word. Partly, again, presence is only loosely rated to sin and redemption. Both the sacrificial cult of the old temple and the work of the son as sin bearer tend to be subsumed under a theology of dwelling. But most telling of all, rather little is said in this remarkable book about the anterior perfection of God. A brief speculative theology of God's presence at the end of the book certainly roots certainly roots God's presence to creatures in God's own imminent triune life of what Congar calls communication and communion. This, he says, is the basis of those communications through which God establishes in creation his increasingly intimate presence. But because presence is construed by him as indwelling, and because God's final ontological indwelling in the incarnate Son is, 
isn't strictly demarcated from his presence to the church, then God's imminent perfection tends to function only as a kind of backcloth to the corporeal and concrete presence of God in what Congar calls the theandric temple, which is the Church of Christ. Well, my instincts, as I'm going to try to show these few lectures, impel me to map the territory rather differently. The, the difference is, at heart, that of treating the imminent perfection of the Holy Trinity not just as the source of or accompaniment to the events of the economy, but as evangelically and therefore dogmatically and metaphysically primary, and so placing it at the head of what is said of God's presence. The order of exposition, like the material order, begins in God. This is not, at least I hope it's not, a regression into a half-Christian theology of divine independence. It's simply an attempt to indicate the unsurpassable and majestic whence of this history of God with us and to direct attention to the end of that history, which is the glory of God. In following this path, much instruction can be gleaned once again from Jonathan Edwards from that extraordinary sermon series on the history of the work of redemption. Here, you'll remember those who've read it, Edwards offers a long unified description of the affair of redemption, the history in which God administers his relations to creatures. Edwards, of course, is profoundly indebted to the federal dogmatics of a century earlier. And because of this, not only is he able to escape the cramping effects of concentration on the morphology of conversion, he also has access to a crucial bit of dogmatic teaching which enables him to place the history of redemption in relation to the perfect life of God. This is the notion of the eternal covenant of redemption in which father and son design to execute saving relations with God's creatures. I want to say more about that uh, in a later lecture. Here, it's sufficient to note that this bit of teaching affords Edwards a way of framing the economy by the antecedent glory of God. In all this, he says, God designed to accomplish the glory of the blessed Trinity in an exceeding degree. God had a design of glorifying himself from eternity to glorify each person in the Godhead. God is Alpha and Omega. The economy for Edwards is a middle reality between God, its origin, and God, its end. As it began in God, so it ends in God. God is the infinite ocean into which it empties itself. Well, from this, the shape of my treatment unfolds. I begin with some reflections on the perfection of God, in which I'm going to consider, first of all, the internal works of God, that is, the processions or relations which constitute the eternal fullness and glory of God's life in himself, and second, the external works of God, that is, the divine missions in which out of, the the, out of that fullness, the persons of the Trinity bestow life upon creatures and protect that life for its future glory. Working in this way, from the doctrine of the Trinity to everything else, this sets what is confessed about God's presence to creatures in the context of God's uncreated fullness. From here, I'm going to proceed to consider the economy of God's presence, moving, as it were, from its outer edges to its inner core, and tracing, not as Congar would have it, an ever-deepening interiority, but rather a progress of ordered fellowship between creatures and their creator and lord, who glorifies his own name by making himself their companion and helper. I begin from some consideration of what we might call God's universal presence, his ubiquity and his providential presence in creation, before turning to consider the special history of God's covenantal and redemptive presence, focused at first in the history of the patriarchs and of Israel and finding its climactic movement its climactic moment in the incarnation of the Son of God. 
In treating this central Christological material, I'm going to try to show how God's incarnate presence is a mode of his perfection. And this requires not only a particular theology of the hypostatic union, in which the word transcendent of the flesh plays an important role, but also emphasis on the lordly rule of the exalted Christ, who presides over and makes himself present to the creatureless sphere in which he took flesh. And the sequence, if we get through to the end, is to be completed by a theology of the communion of the saints, as that human fellowship which is the creaturely counterpart to God's election and which lives by his spiritual presence. Well, it remains in the last few minutes to explain the understanding of revealed theology in which these lectures are an exercise. Revealed, or as the old Protestant divine sometimes called it, supernatural theology, revealed theology is a work of human reason in the communicative presence of the exalted Christ. It is human intellectual work. It's a temporally extended act of making. It's a matter of fashioning a rational representation of its object. Reason isn't passive here, merely receiving impressions. Part of what's involved in saying that we are rational creatures is that, as Ingolf Dalfert puts it, we cannot live in the world without making it. But reason's work of making is neither spontaneous nor wholly critical. It is, rather, an activity of rational fellowship between creatures and their Lord, present in his word by his spirit, declaring himself that creatures may know him and love him and fear him above all things. That being the case, revealed theology can be characterized in terms of its location and its object. Revealed theology takes place first in a particular location, namely the economy of God's grace. More specifically, it takes place in the interval between the ascension and the parousia in which Jesus Christ is head over all things and in which, through the Spirit, he sheds abroad the knowledge of himself. That sphere, that field of reality in which revealed theology is undertaken, is the one which is established by the risen Christ. He is not inert, he is not inert and mute. He is actively communicative. Through his word and spirit, he instructs his church. Jesus Christ speaks. He is not silent. And so theology's intellectual task is not a matter of the pure poetics of reason, but of rational activity in a sphere of reality and knowledge which has been established ahead of all human rational work. This is the sphere in which God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will. The sphere in which it makes sense to pray that God may give a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Revealed theology, if you want, is not searching for an object. It is joyfully and with fear and trembling responding to the gift of the Father of glory, which is revelation, knowledge and enlightenment. The social location of revealed theology is the church. The communicative presence of Christ gathers. That is, it summons an assembly. Revealed theology is one of the ways in which the church so assembled makes sense of the summons which, in which it has its origin and which sustains its existence. In its theology, the church takes seriously the fact that it is the church only insofar as it is a hearing church only insofar as it lives its life as the creature of the word of God. That's why at the heart of revealed theology is attention to the means which are appointed by the risen Christ as bearers of his word to his people, namely the prophetic and apostolic writings of the canon, read in the presence of the exalted Christ, of whom the prophets and apostles are authorized ambassadors, and read with the illumination of his Holy Spirit. Holy Scripture is the cognitive principle of revealed theology. 
just as God's presence in Christ and Spirit is its ontological principle. God in Christ is present. God speaks through the embassy of the prophets and apostles, and so theological reason is set to work. Accordingly, we can speak of the activity of revealed theology as what I call this morning biblical reasoning. Biblical reasoning is the church's attempt reflectively to represent to itself that by which it is addressed in the canon. It is discursive repetition of the word spoken to us by the risen one through his auxiliaries. In terms of the usual post-enlightenment divisions of theological labour, revealed theology straddles two fields, exegesis and dogmatics. As revealed theology, it aims, first of all, at the orderly exegetical elucidation of the canon. Scriptural exegesis, one has to say with some firmness, is not the same thing as exquisite analysis of the history of religion or literature. It is exegesis to which all other interests are wholly subordinate. And revealed theology aims, second, at the conceptual expansion of scripture to display the shape of the canon's instruction. This, we can say, is biblical reasoning as dogmatics. Both activities are directed by and towards the word of God, that is Christ's sheer eloquence, his unhindered self-exposition. In terms of our exercise in these lectures, all this means, first, that revealed theology is not simply a matter of thinking about God's presence, but thinking in God's presence and on the basis of God's presence. God's presence is not just the theme, but the founding condition and energy of revealed theology. Second, it means that revealed theology is a positive science, that is, an inquiry into a given Jesus Christ, his presence, his speech, his address of creatures, always precede theological reason as the positum, the given, which theology hasn't acquired by its own efforts or elected as the special object of its endeavours, but which is something which sets itself before theology as wholly original and authoritative and complete. But what kind of given are we dealing with here? Well, here we move to consider the object of revealed theology. There are, I think, at least two things to be said. First, that which is given to revealed theology as its subject matter is the free spiritual presence of the exalted Christ who rules all things. The object of revealed theology is not an inert or manipulable body of knowledge. It is not something to hand something we can treat as just so much raw material for the operations of reason. It is commanding presence. We are in its power, not it in ours. We do not comprehend it. It encloses us. We do not have the competence or the entitlement to view it from a distance and reach a judgment about it. This object is subject. It is present to us in inalienable and irreducible and transcendent subjectivity beyond the reach of objectification. This is why revelation cannot mean the entire elimination of God's hiddenness. Revelation is not simple transparency. It's not direct openness. It is the free self-presentation of God's majesty, characterised by the infinite reserve of the liberty of God. In Trinitarian terms... The cognitive economy in which theology does its work is brought into being by the revelatory missions of Son and Spirit. And the fountain of those missions is the unfathomable depth of the Father of glory. Second, therefore, the given to which revealed theology is directed is a self-positing presence. The movement of revelation has its beginning wholly within God. It repeats to us God's own self-knowledge. God isn't an object we summon. God is not an object proposed by reason for explanatory purposes. Revelation is God's self-bestowal and therefore uncaused 
because it has no cause other than God's self-determination also to be himself by being God with us. Revealed theology is a rational exercise governed by the great epistemological principle of the fourth gospel. Jesus revealed himself. Well, if there's any substance to these reflections, if both the location and the object of revealed theology is the resplendent presence of Christ in glory, then even here there can be no sidestepping of our finite condition. There is no revelation apart from the spiritual self-presentation of Jesus Christ in time. Revealed theology doesn't, play, doesn't take place after some immediate and wholly available divine self-disclosure. It takes place in the interim realm between the exaltation of Christ to the Father's right hand and his final appearing in glory. Now, of course, this realm, this place where we are now, is not to be defined simply by Christ's absence, but by the special mode of his presence in fulfilment of his promise. As the risen one, Christ meets us and speaks to us. But this doesn't, I think, entail that theology can escape the necessary corollary of Christ's glorification, which is that he occupies his own space, that he is with us only insofar as he is in the heavenly places far above, that, in short, he is not here. All this means, I think, that revealed theology awaits what Calvin called that visible presence of Christ which he will manifest on the last day. Like all theology... It's a theology of pilgrims. It's incomplete. It lacks perfection. That's not to suggest that theology is indeterminate or, in, or unstable or that corrigibility goes all the way down. It's simply to recall that because Christ's presence is unfathomably deep, because as temporal creatures we're still in the sphere of promise, not of fulfillment, then we know in part because of the depth of Christ's presence, revealed theology cannot be about the business of rational demonstration, arranging its objects around itself. Theological certitude, the Protestant scholastics remind us, is not demonstrative because theology is an exhibitive science. It tries to show its object, which is Christ communicatively present to his saints. Revealed theology now is not the theology of the blessed. Still less is it that archetypal knowledge which God has of himself. It is the work of sanctified but not perfected reason in which the saints do not anticipate the final resolution of their condition now of being away from the Lord because the special manner in which Christ elects to be present with them now is sufficient. In this connection, we may perhaps recall how, in the course of rejecting claims about the doctrinal infallibility of the church, Calvin shows how Christ's presence creates both confidence and modesty in the office of instruction. The overarching context for church teaching, and so of theology, is the promise of Christ to guide his church by being present to, us, to it in his spirit. The Lord, Calvin writes, is ever present with his people, and governs them by his spirit. I confess that this spirit is not the spirit of error, ignorance, falsehood, or darkness, but of sure revelation, wisdom, truth, and light. Yet even here, there must be some reserve. The spirit is foretaste, no more. And, says Calvin, believers in this flesh receive only the first fruits and some taste of his spirit. But notice what Calvin says next. The lack of cognitive perfection, which is the situation of faith now, does not generate pure deferral or apophaticism. That would fail to take seriously the promise of Christ's instruction. Rather, what matters is not possessing, but cleaving to the word and its adequacy. Being aware of their own weakness, Calvin says, nothing better is left for us but to keep ourselves carefully within the limits of God's word. And it's for this reason 
that revealed theology necessarily involves the exercise of prayer. Reason prays because it is needy, because it cannot command its object, but must rely on its object to turn in grace. Elsewhere, Calvin writes that in praying, we invoke the presence both of God's providence, through which he watches over and guards our affairs, and of his power, through which he sustains us, weak though we are and well nigh overcome, and of his goodness, through which he receives us, miserably burdened with sins into grace. In short, it is by prayer that we call him to reveal himself as wholly present to us. Well, these lectures are to be an attempt then at dogmatics in the sphere of revelation. Dogmatics is a cheerful and confident science. When it's done well, it exhibits the calm trust which comes from the fact that it doesn't need to find or secure its object. Christ is risen. He is present. He speaks to his church through his ambassadors. Dogmatics is on the other side of the mortal sickness of reason, which was caused by sin and healed by Christ, the complete physician of our wounds, as Augustine calls him. But for all that, dogmatics can't entail relaxation of critical vigilance. We don't, I think, turn to dogmatics with relief as to a science of known quantities. We turn to Christ and his self-presentation. Dogmatic science is not perfected, and the boldness of the gospel is very different from rational competence. The rule in dogmatic work is that through Christ we do indeed have confidence towards God, but this is not because we are competent of ourselves to claim anything coming from us. Our competence is from God. This from God, this apotheu, is the heart of revelation. It is the surpassing splendor of the dispensation of the Spirit in which dogmatics does its work. In that dispensation alone, beholding the glory of the Lord, revealed theology is able to confess that since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Revealed theology, I think, can't go about its business de haut en bas in patrician detachment from its intellectual and cultural surroundings. It just doesn't have dealings with God and the gospel apart from the contingencies and limitations of its time. But more fundamental than those contingencies and limitations are the opportunities afforded by the communicative presence of Jesus Christ. Our present is more than anything a place at which he elects to be present. The church and its theology do not wholly transcend temporal circumstances, nor are they overwhelmed by responsibility towards them, or fear in the face of them. Revealed theology just meets each each set of circumstances as what it is. It looks to the instruction given by the presence of Christ, and it presses ahead to its end. Augustine's description of the promise-laden character of Christian existence applies well, I think, to the work of theological reason. No one has anything of his own except falsehood and sin, he says. But if man has any truth and justice, it is from that fountain after which we ought to thirst in this desert, so that being, as it were, bedewed by some drops from it, and comforted in the meantime in this pilgrimage, we may not fail by the way, but reach his rest and satisfying fullness. That divine fullness... The perfect life of God is the theme for our next lecture. Thanks. I was reminded of an essay by C.S. Lewis, Work and Prayer and also of a statement by our dean that says, a true theologian is the one who prays. Lewis says, prayer is work, and when Christians do it, work is prayer. And how much more when that work is the work of reason in the presence of God? I think we saw someone do some hard work tonight. It may have been hard for us to listen to.
But this is hard theological work that often doesn't get done. It's easier to talk about the theology of leisure or to assign books like the gospel according to Starbucks. Um, that's easy. It's harder to talk about God in public for 60 minutes. Uh, so you may be exhausted, uh, but an exhilarated exhaustion. This is good work. I invite you then to come back to the next five lectures. The next one will be at 4 o'clock tomorrow in the Hinkson Room. If you don't know where that is, that's no excuse, because we're all going to go there now and to greet our speaker uh, over music and dessert. So let's continue to fellowship in the presence of God. Let's go out, but not before I conclude, simply by saying amen. Thanks again, John. So would you go over to the Hinkson Hall? We'll all be uh, heading over. You're all invited.